Hi everyone, and welcome to Sedentia Innovations' latest webinar, Enabling Digital Healthcare and Building Connected Health Capability. I'm Kate Marcian, Director of Business Development, and I'll be your host for today. Just a couple of quick things to point out before we begin to help make the most of your experience today. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions. Please submit them by typing them into the chat section of your control panel. You can submit your questions at any time throughout the presentation and we'll answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the second half. Please also use the chat pane if you experience any technical issues and we'll do our best to resolve these for you. Without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our presenters for today, Pradipto Biswas and Matthew Sarkar. As the head of data science and insights at Sedentia Innovation, Predicto plays a vital role in helping our clients architect and build effective end-to-end -end solutions, leveraging data strategy, data science, machine learning, and AI. He brings more than 20 years experience in all things data. Some of the interesting projects he's done include using unsupervised machine learning to analyze vehicle movements to detect illicit activities, such as the smuggling of people or goods, as well as the social media monitoring for early detection of adverse effects of drugs. Also joining us today is Matthew Sarkar, who's worked in medical device design and technology for more than 25 years across respiratory and orthopedic medicine. Prior to joining Sedenti Innovation as vice president of our medical sector, Matthew worked with the Formula One racing team to reapply their sensing, modeling, and analytic technologies into the healthcare space. He's especially interested in connected diagnostics, digital therapeutics, and the overlapping opportunity states between the two, enabling earlier intervention and optimized outcomes. So with that, I'm pleased to present our first speaker today, Matthew. Matthew, please take it away. Thank you, Kate. Connected health encompasses terms such as wireless, digital, electronic, mobile, and telehealth, and refers to a conceptual model for health management where devices, services, or interventions are designed around the patient needs and health-related data is shared in such a way that the patient can receive care in the most proactive and efficient manner possible. This is Caulfield and Donnelly's definition of 2013, where they also note that all stakeholders in the process are connected by means of timely sharing and presentation of accurate and pertinent information regarding patient status through smarter use of data, devices, communication platforms, and people. A well-known political quote muses that there are decades where little happens and then weeks where decades happen. And over the last 10 years, components of the connected health model have indeed struggled for adoption and to realize the much hoped for disruption to healthcare models. Yet the COVID-19 pandemic has shown beyond the need, real capability and desire across patients and providers to break away from the traditional patterns of care provision and to realize the enormous benefits of connected health technologies. This behavioral shift, boosted by the extraordinary societal and population healthcare demands under the conditions formed, forced by the pandemic, have brought a step change in the take up and enthusiasm for connected health services. In the US, almost 50% of patients are now using telehealth to replace cancelled in-person visits, up from just over 10% of patients who use these services in 2019. Coupled with ongoing rapid advances in IT, we see a real, a real opportunity and will to build back better and truly rethink the delivery of advanced healthcare services under the connected health paradigm. Enabling technologies will continue to increase the convenience and ease of use of access for patients as they consume healthcare services. And governments and payers will continue to seek to drive down healthcare costs whilst improving quality of life. The deployment of personalized connected health systems and services into this environment is said to have a significant impact on all our lives as citizens, patients, and consumers. Connected health 
allows providers to connect across the spectrum of patient needs from testing and diagnosis, treatment, surgical intervention, rehabilitation and follow-up. Perhaps for the first time we can truly draw these steps as a virtuous circle with solutions that capture information to proactively predict, diagnose, manage and deliver interventional therapeutics with the prevention of disease as the ultimate goal. This means interconnected and intelligent care solutions designed around outcomes and enabled with mobile and home-based devices to monitor biomarkers and activities in real time which communicate with personal health records, services and healthcare professionals. For example, this will allow preemptive targeting to identify at-risk individuals before the development of disease symptoms. Personalised or precision medicine then provides the best possible optimised and innovative therapeutics. Organisations are transforming their products and services and themselves to adapt to the new healthcare opportunities they can push with technological advantage and indeed are also pulled by the pandemic-shaped demands of consumers of health services. The push and pull of advances in the field of connected health systems, technologies and services will enable and accelerate the development, translation and provision of advanced healthcare delivery solutions into everyday life and clinical practice towards improved disease management and treatments, enabling precision and preventative healthcare services at reduced costs. Digital biomarkers are a key component at the periphery of a full connected health solution and provide a window through which we can access objective, quantifiable data and measure physiological and behavioural parameters. New wearable and sensing technologies operating at the network edge and at the point of care will continue to reduce the frequency of hospital visits, travel expenses and lost work time. In our previous webinar and accompanying white paper, we discussed improving patient outcomes with digital biomarkers and how they can extend the reach to detection and prevention. Our detailed mapping for the biomarker opportunity space is viewable at SagentiaInnovation.com and allows the six core categories shown here to be expanded into application areas for the various different biomarker formats, portable, wearable, ingestible and implantable, along with some example products. In this piece, we further explore connected health solutions and supporting information and communication technology capabilities required. The variety and complexity of such capability, including cloud architecture, edge computing, cellular and non-cellular communications, data science and machine learning, make it challenging for organisations to plan and navigate their path. Enhanced mobile communication technologies and protocols such as 5G offer low latency, high reliability and high throughput connected health applications, supported by streaming video and immersive media. Other advances in ICT hardware and software allow the development of new architectures for connected health applications, facilitating the opportunities of digital biomarker enabled devices operating at the edge through data gateways and onto cloud computing service models with software, platform and infrastructure as a service. Opportunities that on near the edge push intelligence and processing capabilities down closer to where that data that powers connected health is gathered. Meanwhile, new, inter new interoperability standards like the Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources, or FHIR, should enable the development of integrated connected health solutions. Of course, with connected health reliance and internet connectivity, comes security and privacy vulnerability, and patient or consumer privacy must be secured demanding application of the emerging security and privacy guaranteed protocols, methods and procedures. And through all the connections across the connected health pathway, of course, runs analytical insight, machine and deep learning to support the building of smarter health systems that continually analyze information from multiple sources to drive insights and recommendations with individuals' health profiles, as well as artificial intelligence to monitor device data and use rules and logic to compare against targets, track process, and send alerts. Commercially, the wider development and penetration of connected health systems and services will significantly affect how medical practice, services, and care are provided, making the introduction of new business models, capitalizing on the optimal use and exploitation of connected health services as both highly desirable and absolutely necessary for success. 
Here we will explore various entry points into connected health and progression along the transformative journey, incrementally building capabilities and accumulating value for patients, providers and payers along the way. I'll now hand over to our Predipto Biswas, Head of Data Science and Insight at Sagentia Innovation, to further explore these themes. Uh, thanks, Matt. Let us now explore some of the recent technology trends which are driving the recent advances in connected health and its promises going forward. There are, of course, numerous ones. However, we shall explore six of the most significant ones in this webinar. The first one relates to development of smart, smarter and more diverse sensors. We are now able to create smaller and smaller sensors, and this miniaturization has allowed us to deploy sensors in many more places than was possible previously. In addition to this, accompanying this, we also have an improvement in the, the ability to link these sensors into the central infrastructure. There are a number of networks which have been developed which are dedicated to IoT. So networks such as Sigfox, LoRa, and narrowband IoT. These changes, these developments, are powering an explosion in the number of sensors which are now being deployed all over the world. It is estimated that by 2025, there will be almost 31 billion sensors which are deployed across the globe. This is three to four times the human population at that time. Sensors can now analyze a number of different signals, including blood pressure, temperature, as well as gait, skin, and skin conditions. The second trend relates to the phenomenal growth in computing power, which has now allowed us to pack a greater punch in terms of computing power into the sensors. This now allows us to in execute more powerful and more complex machine learning models and allow them to execute on the sensors without needing to send data back into the cloud or the central infrastructure. This has helped in a couple of different ways. The first being that data no longer needs to be, it, it addresses the data privacy, uh, data protection requirements, but also equally as importantly, we can now have the sensors making very, very quick life and death situation uh, decisions, uh, decisions affecting life and death without needing to uh, call back into the central infrastructure. The third development relates to the improvement in the types of communication which is now available uh, in linking the sensors back into the central infrastructure. Both cellular and non-cellular communications have now improved to a point that sensors can be deployed in increasingly remote areas. This means that remote healthcare is available not just to remote areas within developed countries, but also to populations in poor countries, poorer countries, who have either, hitherto not had access to proper healthcare. The fourth development relates to the improvement in the capabilities or in, in the areas of machine learning and data science. This has now allowed us to harness the data explosion uh, on account of the increasing amount of data which is being generated by the sensors. This has allowed us to, exhale, to overcome the, the, the innate, human innate human limitations in terms of the amount of data that we can process. Using machine learning, we are now able to crunch very large volumes of data, and this has enabled us to uh, use machines for use cases such as gene sequence, sequencing. Uh, AI algorithms such as deep learning have been particularly useful in this respect. The next trend relates to the ubiquity of mobile devices. Because of the explosion in the number of mobile devices which, and smart mobile devices which are now accessible to pretty much everybody, we are now able to both gather more data related to uh, healthcare as well as distribute information. This again has made remote healthcare uh, more of a possibility. We are now able to pay healthcare professionals and now able to engage with patients right from monitoring to prevention of conditions to diagnosis, treatment, and recovery. And all this is now possible 
without requiring patients to frequently travel into hospitals or clinics. The final trend in this area relates to cloud computing. Cloud computing makes uh, uh, the traditional IT capabilities such as, such as uh, disaster recovery, data protection, increasing amount of uh, storage, data storage, as well as availability of advanced compute capabilities such as use of GPUs, all these capabilities are now made available to small and large players alike. This has, allowed, this has removed a very critical barrier to competition in the healthcare space. Smaller, more innovative players in the healthcare space are now able to use these capabilities to uh, come up with more, in, with, uh, to compete with the larger players uh, without me needing to make significant financial investments. We will now talk about some of the pitfalls which are which need to be which we need to be aware of while implementing connected health uh, programs. The first pitfall relates to patient data protection and privacy. Even before any technology is considered, a program needs to think about how they are going to address concerns related to patient data protection and privacy, and this relates to not just legal and regulatory, but also to ethical concerns. Any discussions about health, connected health projects needs to consider how they're going to handle this problem before uh, they make any kind of investment in the technology. Recent developments have shown us that there are many ambitious digital projects across the world which have failed simply because they either failed to protect sensitive medical data or demonstrate that they are doing so. Uh, the second point, the second pitfall to be aware of relates to implementing technology for its own sake. As we've seen, there are a number of exciting technologies which are now available uh, for connected health digital transformation. However, we still need to ensure that the business concerns, including costs of implementation, as well as the quantified benefits of these programs, remain front and center while planning the programs. If that does not happen, uh, we are likely to see a number of failures for large multi-million dollar uh, digital transformation programs. The third pitfall to be aware of relates to architecting and silos. Connected health programs like we've seen so far are fairly complex in terms of architecture. At the minimum, they would have a sensory component uh, which relates to designing and deploying sensors in various areas. It would likely have a communications component for linking the data from these sensors into a central infrastructure. And there would likely be a cloud infrastructure where all this data is going to be stored and processed. Each of these areas of the architecture are typically enabled by specialist players. So it is, uh, uh, so building, such a, building and implementing such an architecture is a fairly complex affair. Companies frequently try to break the problem down by designing different parts of the architecture separately. However, when the time comes to integrate them, uh, they may find that these solutions no longer do not work as desired. In addition, troubleshooting in such situations is made more complex because there are a number of third parties who need to be engaged and coordinated in troubleshooting and making changes to the solution. So architecting in silos is definitely one of the pitfalls we would like to uh, point out. The fourth pitfall relates to having unchallenged uh, paradigms while designing the architecture. We've seen that in many cases, companies, uh, companies in the space like to learn from their peers or indeed peers from other industries when they are building Internet of Things solutions, IoT analytics solutions. However, whilst it is, whilst we definitely support uh, the process of learning from peers and from the experience of peers, we need to always be aware of the paradigms which are inherent when, uh, when, 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 uh, when learning from other 
industries or other, other companies. We need to ensure that every design decision receives robust challenge to ensure that they are the correct ones. To take one example, while building an IoT solution, it, a default decision might be to upload all the data from the sensors, which is generated in the sensors, into the cloud environment. There might well be very sound business reasons for doing so, or indeed a business logic which, can, which could go along the lines of, even if you're not using the data currently, there's a possibility that we might need it in the future, so therefore we need to get it all into the cloud. However, while creating such an architecture, we need to be aware of the implications of that. So for example, if uh, large amounts of data storage, uh, storing of data in the cloud, in commercial cloud solutions, is likely to be fairly costly. So we need to ensure that every architectural decision which is made needs to, is considered in, in, in terms of considerations such as data storage costs, privacy, et cetera. And these costs need to be balanced against the likely benefits, the expected benefits of that specific architectural decision. The final pitfall which we need to be aware of relates to considering not just the costs of implementation of a solution, but also the ongoing costs of the solution. Too frequently, pro design uh, program delivery teams only consider the cost of implementing and putting a solution in place. However, every decision which is made in terms of uh, implementing an architecture also has associated decision, associated costs, such as not just the storage costs, data storage costs, which we talked about, but also costs of cloud computing instances. So the decisions which are made in the architecture in, in terms of whether or not to use virtual VPNs, virtual machines, uh, whether to use uh, containers or indeed use serverless technology. Each of these architectural decisions has an associated cost in terms of what it would cost to maintain that capability. Other costs could include costs of troubleshooting and maintaining of overly complex architectures. So these costs need to be considered when a solution is architected and business stakeholders need to be involved. This is definitely not something which needs, which is, which should be left to the technology uh, professionals alone. I will now hand back to Kate for the next part of the webinar. Great, thank you, Padipto, and thank you, Matthew, both for uh, all the great insights. It's really clear how data truly has the power to transform our health as we know it. Um, I know it's a gentian innovation. There's not a single client that we're working with that isn't thinking about digital health and what that means for their business and how to best implement it. So very timely topic. Um, before we begin the Q&A session, um, Matthew, if you'd like to join us, um, I'd like to just kind of build on a couple points that you made during the presentation that I think are, are excellent. Um, Predicto, can you tell a little bit about, um, you know, when talking about the typical starting points, I know you mentioned some of those during your talk, um, are these the only entry points into digital journeys or are there other avenues that companies might take? To be honest, there are as many entry points into a program like this as there are companies because every company is in a slightly unique situation so and they will need to take cognizance of that before they uh, they plan their digital transformation journey however having said that there are a certain uh, we have seen certain trends in terms of how companies start these transformation programs and the way they enter it and that relates to their uh, what they're trying to do so to give an example we have seen many medical device clients who have uh, products which are market leading, really competitive in the market. And what they wish to do is now uh, develop a digital version, digital dimension to the service which they provide to clients. So they might say that we have this, we have this device which is already connected to, uh, which is already, which is, which has a software component which is already generating data. Now, how do we take the data which we are already generating 
and uh, and deliver value to clients and that value and the value doesn't have to be just to clients it could also be value to the company itself so just as there could be value in to clients in terms of analytics in terms of how these machines are used uh, associated and associated uh, types of analytics there's also there could be value for for the companies in terms of improving the product design understanding if there are different ways the product is used by different types of customers and hence making more focused um, capabilities which are focused on the different types of clients so that's one entry point to the journey the second entry point could be that in many cases clients might say that we have these products but we're not really generating any data out of it what's happening is these products are just being used in the real world and that's it so they might also choose to design and implement sensors which go on these devices so it does all they do all the things which we talked about for the previous group of clients but in this case they also have a problem to solve in terms of what kind of sensors do i want to deploy how frequently do i need to get data out of these sensors do i need to get all the data out at all or is there some processing which i can do on my sensors so th there's a lot of work around the sensor design which also needs to go into it there are other reasons why clients uh, a lot of uh, organizations could enter this journey and that could be everything from our competitors have moved ahead of us in the space so we need to catch up or indeed we just need to do not because we want to improve the product we're already competitive in the market but what we want to do is use the data use the analytics to better engage with our stakeholders for example better engage with surgeons who might be using some of our products so there are a number of trends there but in like just to pre reiterate the previous point uh, every company's situation is going to be slightly unique in some way and that needs to be factored into the architecture and how these programs are planned and executed and you talked about some of the pitfalls and you know not to just you know get into the journey just to for the, the sake of, of doing it that everyone else is doing it um but really you know trying to get that right can you talk a little bit about what's really critical to get right in this uh, I suppose it kind of goes back to the pitfalls which I was talking about. So the first, uh, organizations need to solve that hardest problem first, which relates to the patient data protection, privacy and protection. However, this, is, this problem is not, it's not a trivial problem. And the reason uh, for that is that on one hand, we absolutely acknowledge that data needs to be anonymized in order to protect it in many cases. And that anonymization needs to also take cognizance of the fact that in many cases, even if you were to encrypt or uh, or just uh, if even if you encrypt some of the most uh, the personal identifiable information, such as name, uh, gender, address, social security numbers, things like that, it could still be possible to use the unencrypted data to reconstruct a patient's identity. So that needs to be planned for and handled. However, on the flip side of that, what we also see is that in many cases, the value of analytics comes when we link different types of data sets together. And in order to link these data sets together, we need to be, unique, be able to uniquely identify a patient's information in each of these data sets. So that's almost the flip side of the problem. So that needs to be balanced and planned for. And there are lots of encryption technologies which are uh, which are uh, which are available. And uh, indeed, uh, some of our mathematical folks are also doing some work in this area. So that's the first problem which needs to be handled, and that needs to be handled before anything else, in my opinion. The second problem uh, re relates to uh, kind of balancing balancing the the practicality against the ambition. So we've seen many clients who are starting digital transformation programs, uh, but the, the starting point of those programs is we need to digitize and then analyze some of the data uh, 
which is currently non-digital or non-structured. And examples of such data could be, I've seen one example where this data was like medical notes. The notes which, which doctors take have enormous value. And in, in some cases, I've seen a client which say, okay, let's digitize that and then do the analytics on it. Now, the problem is in these kinds of initiatives, while they're likely to be likely to have a lot of value, they're also likely to be costly and time consuming. So as such, they're not suitable candidates for quick realization of value. So as of the rule of thumb, most organizations are already sitting on more data and they're sitting on huge volumes of data and they're probably not getting the entire, utilizing it fully in terms of the value and the insight which they get from it. So if possible, they should be looking at the initial use cases which already use the data that they're holding, the structured data which they're holding. The third thing which I'd like to call out is essentially keeping an eye on the horizon because these technologies are evolving fast. In future, there's a significant amount of value which will come just from the, the technology around sensors and the value with and the way they are connected in. As we get more computing power, so this kind of goes back to this trends I was talking about. As we get, as we are able to pack more computing power into these sensors, as well as network them better into our central infrastructure, um, we will increasingly be able to do processing on the edge without needing to bring data back into the headquarters, so to speak. This is also going to likely, this is also likely to solve problems such as data privacy to some extent. So Matthew, um, wanted to kind of talk a little bit about um, just connected health in general. Obviously, this isn't a new topic. It's something that's been around for a while. Um, and as you mentioned in the beginning, COVID uh, has rightly brought that into the forefront of everyone's attention. Um, can you talk a little bit about why we're seeing a current focus uh, even more so now on connected health? Sure, yeah, I, I guess there are three broad reasons for why we're seeing such a, a resurgence of interest. The first one is the enormous value which is available across the care pathway to patients, payers and providers. And we've talked about that in this, in this webinar. But connected health, it really does support true focus on, on the value-based models uh, which, uh, which are demanded across, health, across now across health systems. And that means two things, uh, better outcomes and reduced costs. And these really are the two most important uh, components of, the, of, 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 um, of measuring success in healthcare systems. Um, secondly, uh, technical advances have really brought us to the point where we can realize this at scale. Um, and to great effect, so connectivity, the beginnings of data harmonization that we're seeing, and really the, the, the enormous sophistication of the digital tools which are now being made available to patients. Usability, patient centricity, these are key themes, um, and the growing sophistication around these has really brought on a lot of enthusiasm amongst patients, as well as caregivers, and, um, and real adoption. And so far, we're seeing real stickiness at, at scale. And, and the third one, Kate, you mentioned it. I mean, it's, it's impossible to have any webinar on healthcare these days without mentioning COVID, of course. But um, particularly in, in, in connected health, COVID has really catapulted the key, one of the key components of connected health, meaning telehealth. And it's really catapulted that into, I would say it's beyond mere uh, acceptability, but real enthusiasm now for, from patients. This is how they want to receive their care. Um, and it's really crossed over now, I would say, almost from a perception of a kind of a, a second best telephone consult type of thing, because you couldn't actually see the doctor, to actually a real preferred method um, and channel with which to receive their care. Yeah, it really seems like the perfect storm um, to really launch some of these concepts and ideas, I think, that have been around, um, but everything seems to be coming together uh, to really make a difference now. Um, can you, and speaking of, can you tell me a little bit about what areas within healthcare that you see as, as potentially the most affected or disrupted by this change and this revolution? Sure, well, I guess the, I mean, the advantages are, maybe not surprisingly, across all areas of, of healthcare, and, and in that sense, the, the, the clue is, I guess, in the name of connected health, 
um, we're in the middle of a, a chronic care crisis globally, um, but just in the, in the US, almost half of Americans living with a chronic condition, 75% of health care costs in the US actually go on chronic care. Um, and this is something where Connected Health really can make a huge difference, optimizing care across multiple stakeholders um, and providing the efficiencies that are really required for, um, for effective chronic care at a reasonable cost. Um, but also with uh, acute episodes of care, particularly care relating to elective surgery, where there's a defined pathway and an endpoint and an outcome that can be optimized. The connected health paradigm offers clear advantages to manage and improve the journey along the pathway towards a better end point. And again, obviously at, um, as a reduced cost for the healthcare providers. Excellent, and I um, just want to say thank you to everyone who submitted a question. Uh, we're now going to begin answering the questions you've submitted. Uh, please note you can still submit questions if you haven't had a chance to do so yet. You can do so through the chat section of your control panel. So we're going to go to our first audience question. This looks like a good one, Predicto, for you. Um, is it sufficient to just collect the biomarkers and make them available to physicians and other healthcare professionals? And what are some of the other capabilities we need in order to really fully realize the potential of connected health? But to be honest, uh, there is some value in just collecting the biomarkers, just being able to collect all this information and putting them in the fingertips of physicians or other healthcare professionals has some value because these are people who are experienced in their trade and they're automatically able to use this data. However, having said that, uh, we also need to kind of remember that there are humans typically have certain limitations, especially in things like the amount of data that they're able to process at one time, keep in mind and process at one time and find those trends. Now, these are, these are areas where machines are much better than humans and they can complement our capabilities. So if we really want to get value from biomarker data or indeed any kind of data at this scale, it is not sufficient to just collect them and make them available. Uh, we also need to deploy the associated capabilities right from writing, creating dashboards and rules-based reports to more importantly, creating machine learning models, being able to take some of the unstructured data, digitize them using technologies such as natural language processing. There's a lot of visual data which can be digitized using image processing. So all these capabilities need to go hand in hand with the, with the collection of biomarker data in order to truly get value. However, this is just the technology side of things. Uh, Matt, do you have a perspective on this as well? Sure. Well, I suppose what I'd say is it comes back to that pathway and um, biomarkers really operate at the edge and they, they're, they're, they're how we measure and, um, and, and first look at, at, at symptoms and we, can, and we can monitor as a patient progresses along that pathway. But it's really about what you do with the data to then, I suppose, try to optimize that pathway and use the predictive algorithm to actually improve the care that you're giving in real time or care time as we call it so that you can actually uh, modify the care um, pathway that a particular patient might be going on in response to how they're proceeding how they're um, responding to treatment so whilst the uh, the biomarkers very important and it's a way of um, of starting on this on this journey Inevitably, it really comes down to what you can do with that amazing data and how you can improve the pathways. Thank you. Um, so, Pradipto, here's another good one uh, for you. Yep. You shared a number of technology trends. Can you talk a little bit about the commonalities between some of the trends you shared? Well, I suppose if I think about it, uh, all the trends which we talked about, they point towards an overall democratization of within healthcare. So, and that's both on the demand and the supply side. So on the demand side, because of these technologies, there is a low bar lower, it's lowering the barrier to providing healthcare because of better communications, because of mobile devices being available to everybody. We are not able to provide healthcare 
related services to A, to a larger population, B, we're able to provide it more frequently. And this kind of, this care is now available to people without needing them to travel into a clinic or a hospital or to a, to a healthcare facility to receive healthcare. So that's on the demand side. Also on the supply side, I suppose, uh, because of these trends, we are now seeing the barriers to competing in healthcare that's also coming down. So we talked about things like cloud computing. What this does is it allows smaller players who are innovative, who have a good idea to be able to compete in the space and bring out an offering without necessarily needing to invest in building all the IT and compute capabilities, building out a data center, et cetera. So it's also democratizing the, the supply side of healthcare solutions. And uh, one other thing which I suppose I'd like to point out here is that as always with changes comes threats. So especially in the supply side, uh, what we see is that because providing healthcare now has a more significant digital component, the companies who are going to compete best are the companies who have strong digital capabilities. And we know that there are certain players in the tech space. So companies such as Apple or Google who are increasingly making a play in different industries, including healthcare, because they have this enormous tre treasure trove of data, as well as uh, the compute capabilities, which allow them to be a more serious player in these spaces. So it kind of leads to uh, our next question. It's a good question, um, kind of on that topic with Apple and Google. Um, but can you talk about the experiences of other industries who maybe have gone a little bit further in implementing digital into their into their offering. Um, what does the medical industry have to learn from the experiences of these other industries? Yeah, that's a really good point because we I'm I'm a great advocate and indeed we as Sagentia we are we are we we are great advocate of organizations learning from the experiences of other industries to kind of just make sure that we don't repeat the same mistakes. Uh, so if you think about it. One of the industries which has probably handled some of the similar, say, similar sorts of problems as healthcare is financial services. Now, I have personal experience here because I've spent a significant part of my career there. Now, like medical, financial services is also it's a heavily regulated industry. Data protection and privacy is of concern. And it's also an industry where there's a lot of investment which is put into innovation. Now, in some ways, uh, this, is a pro this is a product of the fact that the financial crisis as well as the tough regulations have forced financial services companies to invest in these areas. But there are certain learnings which we can leverage. So for example, if you think about one example is explainable AI. Now, you need to use AI. However, you also need to make sure that you're able to explain the decisions which your machine learning models have made, for example. So that has guided, that limits and that guides you towards certain choices in terms of what algorithms you use, how you architect, how you store your data, et cetera, et cetera. And these sorts of learnings, uh, is, uh, it's, 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 it's quite advisable to kind of leverage some of these learnings from other industries. And uh, Matt, I think this is a good, this other question here, I think it's really good um, to hear your perspective. Um, but can you talk a little bit about how you see healthcare shifting to a more preventative model and you know perhaps some of the incentives for that shift? Sure, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And um, I mean, wrapped up in that is a really good point that healthcare will only truly be revolutionized when we move to that predictive model. So there's a lot of, I suppose, if you like, in the first wave of digital health, there's been a lot of interest in what we would call descriptive analytics and they are interesting <laughs> but uh, what's really key is to get beyond the merely interesting and move it on to a predictive analytic that can be acted upon in that care time to um, to actually change outcomes so it's definitely the direction of travel um, what what needs to be done well adequate sharing of uh, data across different sources, interoperability, we've talked about it today, this is absolutely key to, to build um, algorithms and of course then the sophistication of those machine-built predictive algor algorithms and those technologies 
are going to be absolutely critical to success here. But what I would say is the incentives are absolutely clear. Again, we've mentioned it, but it's the ability to amend the treatment along the pathway in response to a predicted outcome to then uh, optimize that outcome. It just leads to better results, lower costs, and most importantly, getting things right first time without having to go around the loop again. Yeah, and there's probably a, a big element to, um, you know, empowering the physician, but also empowering the patient, where if they have more information and can then take better preventative steps in their their own healthcare too, which is fantastic. Absolutely. Um, Producto, can you? Here's another good question. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you see this changing the work practices among healthcare professionals? Obviously, digital ha has disrupted other industries. How do you see that uh, potentially changing uh, that for healthcare professionals? Uh, you're right. It is disrupting uh, digital healthcare, like it is. It has disrupted every all the other industries. I suppose uh, the main thing which I'd like to call out is that. This, if you look at the sort of things which machine learning models, predictive modeling model uh, algorithms, or indeed any kind of machine learning does, is that it it automates some of the more manual stuff, the more effort intensive stuff, uh, which is required in pretty much any industry and definitely also in, in, in healthcare. So it automates some of the more mundane tasks, if you will. Uh, around collection of data, integrating it together, uh, finding patterns in large volumes of data, etc. The thing is, once that happens, it frees up humans to focus on the more value-added stuff. So uh, you now have uh, the ability to kind of focus on the really, really critical insights. So any machine can point out that a group of data is anomalous compared to the rest however you still need a human to kind of look at it and go okay that seems like that's a false anomaly versus that looks like it's a disease there or that looks like that group of consumers response to treatment in a slightly different way compared to the rest of the cohort whatever so i think machine learning will change the the content of work but it's going to be in it's likely to transform the sort of work which is done to more satisfying the sort of thing which people find mental stimulation from. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's one part of it. I suppose just to address the other part of it, which is that it is, I don't see it as something which will reduce the amount of work which humans have to do, because yes, on one hand, you are automating certain more mundane repetitive tasks. However, uh, the fact is that we also, need to expand the number the amount of healthcare which needs to be provided because there is still a significant population across the globe who do not have access to healthcare and we do need to provide them healthcare even from a selfish perspective because as we've seen with the recent pandemic you cannot keep healthcare issues you cannot keep illnesses and pandemics limited to one part of a connected globe so i don't i don't think this will result in job losses like a lot of people are are, uh, are fearing on the other hand i feel like this is actually going to transform the content of work for the better thank you yeah that's an excellent point and if you look at countries like china and india there's just a real resource constraint on the healthcare professionals so it's really um you know required to, to be able to get to that reach um yeah. so thank you for the the encouraging response to that. Um, so we have time for one more question. I think this is a great one to, to wrap it up on. Um, Matt, it would be great to hear your thoughts on what do you see as what's next? What, what are the next steps that are really required to kind of further develop and exploit, uh, you know, the concepts behind Connected Health? Sure, thanks. Yeah, I, th I think we've, I guess we've touched on uh most of the elements of, of development in 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 this in this webinar and i'll just uh list them out again really as areas that would need further development we're on a journey with this and the um it the things are constantly developing and we can we can we, we can see a massive improvement and the ability to really realize some of the ideas behind connected health but what this will requ require is data harmonization 
and interoperability of that, those data sources, um, further optimization of the data collection, and of course, as we discussed in the last question I answered, the, the shift to predictive modeling um, is absolutely key, and we'll see a step change there when we truly um, get our arms around that problem. Um, beyond that, continued acceptance and uh, adoption of these digital tools, um, and that's on the part of the patients um, as, as much as anything. And I think that's a really good point to maybe end on that across all of this technology, patient centricity remains absolutely key and is the um, is the make or break for acceptance here. And stickiness to these digital digital solutions um, is really what's going to make or break the ultimate adoption of connected health technologies. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for your time today. Uh, in respect of everyone's time, that's all we have for today. Uh, we hope that everyone's enjoyed the presentation. And uh, again, thank you, Matthew and Predicto. Um, thank you. I realize, yes, I realize there are still questions that we didn't have a chance to respond to. Uh, we'll be following up either Predicto, Matthew, or I, or someone from the Sedentia Innovation team. Uh, we'll be sure to follow up and uh, get a response to your question. Please note, you, if you'd like to receive uh, this presentation or watch it again, we'll be sending you a link uh, shortly after today. Um, you may also find it on our website at sedentiainnovation.com in the coming days, it'll be posted. If you'd like more information about the topics we discussed, or if you have a digital health uh, you know, challenge that you'd like to discuss with us, uh, please go ahead and reach out to us at info at sedentiainnovation.com. And soon after the webinar, you'll receive a survey. We would appreciate if you complete and provide us with your feedback. It'll help us to continue to improve and provide you with meaningful content in the future. For additional information or to, uh, to follow us at Sedentia Innovation, please go ahead and follow us at LinkedIn or Twitter. On behalf of Sedentia Innovation and our presenters, Matthew and Predicto, thank you again for joining us today. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you.